Introduction to Your Straw Man, reading from Moses Washington, Justinian Deception, Redemption Manual, Banker's Manifesto, and with additional information throughout. As a child, you have had an imaginary friend. You may be surprised to learn that evidence exists that you have had a make-believe twin from the time your mother and father permitted a birth certificate to be filed for you. This make-believe friend is not real, but artificial. It is a straw man, an artificial entity that has a name very similar to yours. Here is a definition of straw man. A front, a third party who is put up in name only to take part in a transaction. Nominal party to a transaction. Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition. The term is also used in commercial and property contexts when a transfer is made to a party. The straw man simply for the purpose of retransferring to the transferer in order to accomplish some purpose not otherwise permitted. Barron's third edition. So in layman's terms, the straw man is an artificial person. The straw man was created by law shortly after you were born via the registration of the application of your birth certificate. The name for the straw man is your name in all capital letters. You will notice that the inscription on the birth certificate is your name in all capital letters. If yours is not in all capital letters, the registration will be. You will still have a straw man. The English language has precise rules of grammar that make no provision for writing proper nouns in all capital letters. So your name spelled with all capital letters is a fictitious name. From Justinian Deception, hidden foreign text known as Dog Latin, mother of all deceptions, the concept of modern-day slavery. The secret foreign sign language hidden in plain sight. Dog Latin, the poison in the text. It is a poisonous gloss that corrupts the essence of the text. This story is about simple English text and a hidden text that has been usurped into the English text without you ever being aware of such a deception. This story explains how a foreign alien text appears in contracts, court orders, on your driver's license, passports, etc without you ever being aware that such a foreign text existed. This trick played upon the unsuspecting public is administered by the true dogs of the underworld in order to render you as a trustee of a foreign corporate banking entity that is alien and foreign to your true sovereignty. The lawyers, judges, and the courts and their military police are the administrators of this hidden secret deception played upon the masses in order to maintain control of such slaves. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition, Dog Latin is the language of the illiterate. It is the Latin all uppercase text usurped into the English descriptive text. Dog Latin is found on the ledger, tombstones, and by you being attached to it, renders the presumption of confirmation sign that you have sinned and you are dead. You are no longer the servant of the God of living man. You have become the servant of the underworld, the gods of the dead corporation, the servant of the Vatican, the debtor of the debtor, subject to the Justinian corpus juris, language of the dead. The Vatican holds the souls of the dead, and the dog Latin is the language of the dead. There is no all uppercase text constituted in the English grammatical rules. It does not exist, and there is also no unhyphenated strings of signs in the Latin or American sign language. Article 11, 147, Chicago Manual of Styles also states that there is no correspondence between the words and signs of any two languages, meaning the dog Latin has no jurisdiction with the written English on any instrument, contract, unless agreed. If this written text is English, in upper and lower case letters, and this is proper symbolic sign language, Latin, all uppercase letters with hyphens, then what is this text without the hyphens in all capital letters? Your straw man has a same sounding name as your name, but is an artificial entity which exists only by force of or in contemplation of law. Same sounding names are also called item sonans, sounding the same or alike, having the same sound, a term applied to names which are substantially the same, though slightly varied in the spelling, such as Mark, and Mark, and Robin and Robin, and Nathaniel and Nathaniel. The all caps name is not your true name, which consists of the given Christian name plus the surname, family name, and appears with only initial letters capitalized. 
The all caps version of your name is a trade name, the name under which you do business. We may also say that the straw man is a person according to the legal dictionary. Person, one, a human being. Two, an entity such as a corporation that is recognized by law as having the rights and duties of a human being. The straw man may also be said to be an artificial person, which is also defined in the legal dictionary. An entity, such as a corporation, created by law and given certain legal rights and duties of a human being, a being, real or imaginary, who for the purpose of legal reasoning is treated more or less as a human being. Also termed fictitious person, juristic person, legal person, moral person, Black's Law Dictionary, 7th edition. A straw man may also be thought of as a legal fiction. Legal fiction, assumption of fact made by court as basis for deciding a legal question, a situation contrived by the law to permit a court to dispose of a matter. Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition. A legal fiction like the United States as defined in 28 U.S. Code 3002. Definitions. United States means a federal corporation. As we explore further, we must distinguish between the straw man, an it or person, and the real flesh and blood being, human being, which we will call a man. Man has a legal definition, a human being, a person of the male sex, a male of the human species above the age of puberty. In the most extended sense, the term includes not only the adult male sex of the human species, but women and children. In feudal law, a vassal, a tenant, or feudatory. Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition. So we conclude that man is a term of nature. But who created nature? Some would say God, others would say the creator, a term often used by the founder of our country, while others might hold a different view. On the other hand, we see person as a term of the civil law. Who is the creator of civil law? Civil law a rule of civil conduct prescribed by the supreme power of a state, the civil or municipal law of the Roman Empire. Valentine's Law Dictionary, 3rd edition. So kings, emperors, or legislative bodies acting a sovereign capacity are the creators of civil law. When our government acts as a sovereign, it is acting outside its constitutional authority. So we see that a man and a person are very different terms identifying very different things. If you study Roman civil law, you will see that it originates and uses fictions of law, that is, concepts that are contrary to the natural order of things and based upon presumptions that are untrue. You will realize that this person recognized in a civil law is a fictional entity. You will come to see the vast difference between man and person. So the man, straw man is a person a public name that is recognized in a civil society. We've mentioned legal fiction and fiction of law, so let's see how these are defined. Fiction of law, an assumption or supposition of law that something which is or may be false is true, or that a state of facts exists which has never really taken place. An assumption for purposes of justice of a fact that does not or may not exist. A rule of law which assumes as true and will not allow to be disproved something which is false, but not possible, but not impossible. Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition. Here is a picture of something that is false, but is considered true by children in this case. And here is a slogan that is considered true by millions, but that is not at all true. Land of the free because of the brave. This distinction between a man and a person is a difficult concept to grasp, but a proper understanding of the relationship between the government, the man, and the straw man is essential to gaining increased freedom. While the concept of these relationships is very simple, there are some foundational principles that must be explored. We have mentioned that the straw man is an artificial entity or person, but there are several types of organizations or artificial entities there are corporation souls, aggregate corporations, municipal corporations, revocable living trusts, soul, and unincorporated business organizations. 
Many people use these entities for various reasons, including maintaining personal control over their assets, protection from lawsuits and judgments, avoidance of probate, avoidance of estate taxes, reduction in tax liability, and many other reasons. We will look into the difference between a sole entity and an aggregate entity, the construction of these entities and the results of that construction as it applies to the straw man. In all organizations, there are two basic operational positions. Number one, the stockholder slash owner slash beneficiary. We will call this the beneficiary position and two, the officer slash president slash chairman slash trustee. We will call this the operational position. A sole corporation, as defined by Black's Law Dictionary, is one consisting of one person only and his successors in some particular station who are incorporated by law in order to give them some legal capacities and advantages, particularly that of perpetuity, which in their natural state as persons they could not have. In a corporation sole, one person holds both operational positions and the organization. A corporation sole may be established under legislative authority. It is considered by statute a citizen of the government. As such, the safeguards of the Bill of Rights do not extend to corporate souls. The courts have warned that statutory licensed sole proprietorships are in fact a government agency by definition of how they are created. Most people who chose a sole organization do so because they maintain personal control over their assets. An aggregate corporation, such as corporations or business trusts, according to Black's Law Dictionary, is composed of a number of individuals vested with corporate powers. With an aggregate organization, different parties must hold the beneficiary and operational positions. If the same party holds them, they are a sole organization. Family members are always counted as one party, therefore would be a sole organization. In an aggregate organization, the one who is in control is immune from damages or liabilities of the beneficiaries. In an aggregate corporation, the holder of the first operative position controls the assets for the holder of the second operative position. The control of the assets has been turned over to someone else's control. The founder of the wealthy Rockefeller family once said, the secret to success is to own nothing but control everything. In other words, always function from an aggregate relationship. Do not own the straw man, control the straw man. If you are not the beneficiary owner of the straw man, you are not liable for his debts or obligations. If you are in control, you have the slightest lien hold interest on the straw man. You must be paid before anyone else collects from the straw man, and you cannot go to jail for his misdoing. A look at the structure of the straw man entity shows the ownership slash control relationship and which position it is best to hold. Prior to the redemption process, redemption is a term used among freedom-loving people to describe the process of regaining control of your straw man. The man is considered both a beneficiary in the relationship and surety for the straw man. The redemption process is also called the secured party process. After redemption, the man is no longer a beneficiary or surety. After redemption, the man is a controller and creditor with the highest lien in hold interest in the straw man. The man is now in an aggregate relationship with the straw man. He does not own the straw man, but he controls the straw man by the primary lien hold interest. In this country, the power was granted to government by the people. People, excuse me, power is granted to the government by the people individually to create states and by the people as a whole to create the national government. Once the people decided individually to create states, they can only change the policy or law of the state as people collectively. That is because they have agreed to become part of the public. They are one person in a larger body of people that act collectively. The people are in the state and national government at the same time. The public government is an artificial entity. The government is owned and controlled by the same people. So the government is a sole organization, not an aggregate organization. 
as long as a man is dealing publicly, he is in a sole relationship with the public. The straw man, being artificial, lives in the artificial place called the public. At the same time as people are acting collectively in the larger body of people called the state and national government, they maintain their ability to act individually on a private basis. The people did not give up the rights they did not delegate to the government. They retain those rights. Any man can contract privately as they see fit, and government cannot interfere with the private contracts of men. The straw man lives in the public side of government. He is part of the public government and functions under the laws of the public. This is necessary and proper because the creator of an entity has the right to control it. Since the government created the straw man, it is only right that the straw man live under the rules of its creator. This is what some of the federal employees of that corporation look like. But once the straw man has been redeemed, the government is no longer in control of the straw man. He is now controlled by the man using his right to private contracts. The man has left the public as a beneficiary in sole relationship to the straw man to live privately as creditor in an aggregate relationship with the straw man. As far as this relationship is concerned, the straw man is privately controlled. The straw man will still exist as a public entity because that is the only world in which he has reality. His relationship with the man is private. The relationship with the man being is controlling because the man has a higher priority lean on the straw man than the government. Now that we understand who the straw man is, it is appropriate to ask who benefits from the creation of the straw man. We will see that the straw man benefits the creator, the government, any company that uses it, and you. The government began to benefit from the straw man in 1933. In the article on the U.S. bankruptcy, we've already seen evidence that the United States went bankrupt in 1933. The Act of October 6, 1917, the Trading with the Enemy Act, on March 9, 1933, Congress amended the definition of the enemy to include the American people accused of compounding the national emergency of gold, real money, hoarding which it was within their right to do, if they were, and being the cause for Proclamation 2039, which called for the closing down of the banking system for three days. Excerpt from FDR's first inaugural address, March 4, 1933. But in the event that the Congress shall fail to take one of these two courses, and in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. National emergency in the United States declared by CEO Franklin Delano Roosevelt, March 9, 1933, Again declared during the Korean conflict by CEO Truman, December 16, 1950. Again declared by CEO Nixon on March 23, 1970. And again on August 15, 1971. Again declared by reason of the terrorist attacks by 9-11 terrorist CEO George Bush on September 14, 2001. Media release. The people are the enemy since March the 9th, 1933. The United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the president may seize property, organize and control the means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, seize and control all transportation and communication, regulate the operation of private enterprise, restrict travel, and control the lives of all American citizens. Having digested the current state of emergency that presumes to strip you of all your rights in the eyes of your so-called government, how does this excerpt from UCC-1 filing for status correction sound to you? The undersigned tendering this document is a trustee, secured party, bailey, by fact, not 
a straw man vessel in commerce, corporate fiction, legal entity, and legis, or transmitting utility of, for, by, or to the United States of America, the government of the United States, the state of whatever your state is, or to United States Corporation. Pause video to read the entire page. By the way, according to current laws, as found in 12 U.S.C. Section 95B, everything the President or the Secretary of the Treasury has done since March 4, 1933, is automatically pre-approved by Congress. The actions, regulations, rules, licenses, orders, and proclamations heretofore or hereafter taken, promulgated, made, or issued by the President of the United States or the Secretary of the Treasury since March the 4th, 1933, pursuant to the authority conferred by subsection B of section 5 of the Act of October 6th, 1917, are hereby approved and confirmed. In other words, since March 4th, 1933, no president has bypassed Congress. No executive order issued by a CEO president has been done without pre-approval. The CEO is free to issue any executive orders his central banker puppet masters order him to issue. When the government was officially bankrupt in 1933, the governors of all the states met to discuss what should be done. The state governors made a pledge to the federal government to fund the bankruptcy. They pledged the assets and the energy of the people belonging to the state governments. They would back the government and secure the national debt. But there was one problem. The states could only speak for the people in their public capacity. They could not pledge private, living human beings or property, so it was necessary to create a bridge between the living people and the creditors for the bankruptcy. The answer was to create straw men to stand in place of the people. A, the White House, cannot interact with B, a living flesh and blood man or woman, without the transmitting utility, straw man. Now, the only problem was devising a scheme whereby the people would agree to contract with a straw man as its surety. When the governors made the pledge, they agreed to register the application form for the birth certificates of the people with the U.S. Department of Commerce. The application form for the birth certificate is the security instrument collateral used to back the pledge. The straw man, the legal fiction, was created by using the name on the birth certificate and writing it in all capital letters, the designation for a legal fiction. Then, because of the pledge, the people were determ determined to be the representative and surety for the legal fiction. This is how they made us responsible to pay back the debt of the United States. When the government or any corporation uses any process whatsoever, they are using it against the legal fiction, which they want the people to think is them. But when a name is written in all capital letters, it is not the name of a real person. It is the designation of a legal fiction. That is an entirely separate entity. A living human cannot be a legal fiction, and a legal fiction cannot be a living man, human. One is real or natural, the other is created by law. Because the entire thing is based on paying the bankruptcy, the straw man is the debtor and the government is agent for the creditor, the international bankers and their descendants who own the Federal Reserve. Some people think the Federal Reserve banks are U.S. government institutions. They are not government institutions. They are private credit monopolies which prey upon the people of the U.S. for the benefit of themselves and their foreign and domestic swindlers, and rich and predatory money lenders. 75 Congressional Record 1295-12603. I believe the time will come when people will demand that this Federal Reserve System be changed. I believe the time will come in this country when they will actually blame you and me and everyone else connected with this Congress for sitting idly by and permitting such an idiotic system to continue. Congressman White, Wright Patman, Democrat, Texas, September 29, 1941. Congressional Record. I often ask, why does no one question the national debt? The government has the right to coin, make, print its own money with no debt at all, but instead it borrows it from the Federal Reserve, 
a private bank. Why? The answer is the entrance to the rabbit hole. And you might also ask yourself this question. Why has a bankrupt nation with debt increasing $1 million or more every minute been giving military aid to Israel since 1949 on average to the tune of $10,500,000 per day? Whenever a government, government agency, such as a court, determines liability, it is a liability of the straw man since everything is done in commerce. The people are presumed, as evidenced by the pledge of their governors, to be the surety for the straw man and they must pay the liability. Now let's see how the straw man benefits others. Our straw man is thought of as a u transmitting utility, which we define as an agent solely utilized for the purpose of transmitting commercial activity for the benefit of the secured party. Government and big business have set up a system so that the only way a man has, can access the goods and services of the nation is through the straw man. The straw man serves as a utility through which goods and services may be transmitted to you. You are forced to interface with society through your straw man. You will notice that the straw man's name is used on virtually all public documents, including but not limited to birth certificate, driver's license, passport, social security card, bank account, checks and statements, credit cards, the checks you receive from your employer, legal documents, any letter from the government entity at any level, etc. You will discover that government agencies, banks, and other corporations, courts, and tax agencies deal with you exclusively through the straw man. These organizations insist on dealing with you only via an all-caps version of your name in any and all key documents, contracts, accounts, and agreements with them. One of the many benefits and services made available through your straw man is the Social Security number. The SSN is a public number associated with a public persona, your straw man. The SSN is a benefit because it allows you to open a bank account or to get a job. A federal law was passed in 1994 that made it a requirement to give your SSN to a driver's license, to get a driver's license. It would be difficult, though not impossible, to do any of these things without using the SSN. All of these things and many more can be thought of as benefits granted to the straw man. But because these benefits come with a price, it should be obvious that the straw man has no body and that you benefit from the consumption use of the goods and services made available through the straw man. At this point, you probably do not hold title to your straw man. The redemption process, also known as the secured party process, can correct this problem. Since these things are true, it is also true that you are the one responsible for discharging the public liabilities associated with the benefits that you enjoy courtesy of your straw man. These public liabilities include, but not are, are not limited to, income tax, social security tax, plus any and all debts of a straw man incurs. For further evidence that the straw man is not you, look at your personal checks. Here is an example of a check. Notice the all caps name, John Straw Man. You will not find your true name on your checks. Take special note of the signature line that ends with the letters MP, which stands for microprint. If you look carefully at the signature line using a magnifying glass, you will notice that it is not a solid line. The line is made up of some words and spaces that are repeated over and over again as shown here. Authorized signature only. Why? Because you are authorizing your straw man. The all capital letter debased dog Latin name. As an aside, do an image search for John Doe personal checks and you will find numerous check images employing the upper and lower case name. But just try to get a bank to send you your checks this way. They won't do it. And your insistence on that point will probably result in you not getting any checks. Nobody will format your checks as seen below. And having examples of checks on the internet with upper and lower case letters is probably not an accident. The reason the signature line on personal checks is made up of the words authorized signature is because it is a physical impossibility for the account holder, your straw man, to sign the check. Remember, your straw man has no hands with which to sign the check. 
The banks know that every signature appearing on a personal check is the signature of the flesh and blood agent, the authorized representative, you. However, the words are printed in microprint to disguise the fact that you are the authorized representative rather than the principal on the account. When you sign the check or any other document for the straw man, you are actually an accommodating party, i.e. a surety, and therefore 100% liable for everything the principal straw man is liable for. This is further proof that you are liable for the benefits you receive through your straw man. Do not despair. There is a way out of this malaise. There are a couple of elements to a strategy to gain freedom. One element is to copyright your name, both your true name, the all caps version, and all its derivatives. A second element is to use UCC filings to take control of your straw man, a process that is often called redemption. Note, depending on who you employ to guide you through your redemption slash secured party process, the common law copywriting of your name will be included in the UCC-1 filing. The plan was well on its path by 1933. Massive registration, surrender of property through United States agencies, including the state subdivisions, was assuring that the United States and its officers would get rich beyond their wildest expectations. All of this was done without full disclosure. If a remedy was available, and the people chose not to or failed to use the remedy, no charge of fraud could be sustained even in a common law court. The United States only needed to provide the remedy. It was not required to explain it or even tell the people where the remedy could be found. If the people did discover their remedy, the United States had to honor it and release the registered property back to the people, but only if the people knew they had a remedy, and only if they re requested it in the proper manner. In 1933, the United States put its insurance policy into place with House Joint Resolution 192 which provided that the United States subjects and employees could use any type of coin and currency to discharge a public debt as long as it was in use in the normal course of business in the United States. For a time, United States notes were the currency used to discharge debts. But later, the Federal Reserve and the United States provided a new medium of exchange through paper notes and debt instruments that could be passed on to a debtor's creditors to discharge the debtor's debts. That same currency, Federal Reserve Notes, is used to discharge public debts. In the 1950s, the Uniform Commercial Code was presented to their states as a means of unifying the generally accepted procedures for handling the new legal system of dealing with commercial transactions and fictions as though they were real. Security Instruments, Commercial Paper, Replace substance as collateral for debts. Security instruments could be supported by presumptive contracts. Debt instruments with collateral and accommodating parties could be used instead of money. Money of exchange and the need for money was disappearing, and new money was being created, i.e. money of account, created by bill of exchange, and a uniform system of laws had to be put in place to allow the commercial venue and the courts to uphold the security instruments that depended on commercial fictions as a basis for compelling payment or performance. By 1964, most all the states had adopted the Uniform Commercial Code, which is merely a codification of accepted and required procedures all people engaged in commercial activities must follow. Presumption became a big part of the law. Without giving a degree of force to presumption, the new direction in enforcing commercial claims could not be supported in their courts. Profits from all the register things, such as land, cars, guns, children, etc., had to be put into a constructive trust for the benefit of the owners. If the profits were put into the general fund of the United States and not into separate trusts for the owners, the scheme would represent fraud. The profits for each owner could not be commingled. If the owner failed to use his available remedy, fictional credits held in a constructive trust account, fund, or financial ledger, to benefit from the profits, it would not be the fault of the deceivers. If the owner failed to learn the law that would open the door to his remedy, it would not be the fault of the deceivers. The owner is responsible for learning the law, so he understands that the profits from his things are available for him to discharge debts or charges brought against his public person, 
debtor straw man by the United States. The Uniform Commercial Code is that remedy. Names are nothing more than property. No one is his trade name, all caps spelling of your name, nor is anyone his true name. A name can be trademarked, service marked, and copyrighted by the owner for the purpose of restricting others from unauthorized use and just enrichment at the expense of the owner. If you are 18 or older, you, the flesh and blood man or woman, own your name and, may, and you may copyright it under the common law. After, after copywriting your name, no one will be able to use your name to enrich themselves without first gaining your agreement. Let's say a police officer pulled you over and wanted to give you a ticket. You can warn the officer that he is using your copyrighted name for financial benefit and that it is a violation of your copyright. You should also inform him, him that to persist in the use of your copyrighted material without your permission carries an automatic penalty of $500,000. You've just formed a legally binding verbal contract with the officer. If the officer then persists in using your name without permission, he has breached the contract. You then have the right, under UCC Article 9, to default judgment against them using non-judicial proceedings to collect on the debt that he owes you. This is a very powerful concept that can be used in dozens to hundreds of ways. The copyright notice also establishes a private contract between you and your straw man whereby you offer services to the straw man, for example, signing documents for it, in exchange for certain considerations. You become the creditor over your straw man who becomes the debtor to you. You can file a UCC financing statement to receive official government acknowledgement of this private contract. This UCC is a financing statement which creates an interest in property that secures payment slash performance of an obligation by your straw man for the services you render to it. This UCC filing establishes a seniority position of claim over the other creditors who may make a claim based upon date and time of filing. In this way, if any party ever attacks your straw man's assets, you will have a superior claim on it. U.S. Congressman Charles A. Lindbergh Sr. from Minnesota, who opposed the Federal Reserve Act, revealed this before the U.S. Congress sometime during his term of office between the years of 1907 and 1917 to warn the citizens. We bankers must proceed with caution and guard every move made, for the lower odor of people are already showing signs of restless commotion. Prudence will therefore show a policy of apparently yielding to the popular will until our plans are so far consummated that we can declare our designs without fear of any organized resistance. The Farmers Alliance and Knights of Labor organizations in the United States should be carefully watched by our trusted men, and we must take immediate steps to control these organizations in our interest or disrupt them. At the coming Omaha Convention to be held July 4, 1892, our men must attend and direct its movement, or else there will be set on foot such antagonism to our designs as may require force to overcome. This, at the present time, would be premature. We are not yet ready for such a crisis. Capital must protect itself in every possible manner through combination, conspiracy, and legislation. The courts must be called to our aid. Debts must be collected. Bonds and mortgages foreclosed as rapidly as possible. When through the process of the law the common people have lost their homes, they will be more tractable and easily governed through the influence of the strong arm of the government applied to all central power and imperial wealth under the control of the leading financiers. People without homes will not quarrel with their leaders. History repeats itself in regular cycles. This truth is well known among our principal men who are engaged in forming an imperialism of the world. While they are doing this, the people must be kept in a state of political antagonism. The question of tariff reform must be urged through the organization known as the Democratic Party, and the question of protection with the reciprocity must be forced to view through the Republican Party. Thus, by thus dividing voters, we can get them to expand their energies in fighting over questions of no importance to us. 
except as teachers to the common herd. Thus, by discreet action, we can secure all that has been so generously planned and successfully accomplished. Look within for the solution. You are the solution. Pull the rug out from beneath the parasitic bankers and their system of governance designed to manipulate money and disrupt the free market for the benefit of special interest groups that are adverse to freedom, liberty, and love itself. <laughs>